Hi, I'm Graham McFarland. I'm an assistant professor of the Division of Vascular Surgery and Endovascular Therapy at the University of Alabama in Birmingham, and I'm also the co-director of the UAB Limb Preservation Program. I'll be talking to you today about the diagnosis of chronic limb-threatening ischemia. We'll start by talking about the definition of chronic limb-threatening ischemia and then touch on the prevalence risk factors, natural history diagnosis, and then move on to classification of disease and ultimately uh, what treatments are available uh, for this diagnosis. Chronic limb-threatening ischemia is a relatively new um, term uh, and basically is replacing the antiquated uh, term critical limb ischemia and, and the basic difference is that the chronic limb-threatening ischemia focuses more on the clinical presentation with uh, confirmation based off hemodynamic studies as opposed to pure hemodynamic uh, measurements uh, that were used for the critical limb ischemia uh, diagnosis. Um, looking at the prevalence of uh, peripheral arterial disease within the U.S. population, you see that this is a uh, pr predominantly a disease of the elderly. Uh, historically, PAD has been uh, presumed to be uh, a higher prevalence in the male population. However, recent studies have shown that uh, within high-income countries this, this is the case, but in lower-income countries, actually women have a higher prevalence of peripheral arterial disease. Uh, there are studies showing that the, the prevalence of peripheral arterial disease within the African-American population is higher th uh, than that within the Caucasian population, and then Hispanics and uh, the Asian population ultimately have a lower uh, prevalence of peripheral arterial disease. Uh, it's hard to say at this point whether this is related to a genetic difference or if environment plays more of a role here with some studies showing that um, as populations migrate, uh, the prevalence of PAD shifts with the environment that they migrate to, and so that this may play, ultimately play more of a role than the actual genetic makeup. Trying to determine the prevalence of chronic limb-threatening ischemia is rather difficult because there's lack of high-quality um, uh, epidemiology data to support this. This is partly due uh, to the fact that uh, the, the data for chronic limb-threatening ischemia is typically extrapolated from peripheral arterial disease data as well as intermittent claudication data. And uh, as we know, um, peripheral arterial disease does not always progress to chronic limb-threatening ischemia in a predictable manner. Also, the combination of a clinical diagnosis along with hemodynamic data is hard to uh, obtain from large population studies. Looking at risk factors for peripheral arterial disease, uh, you see them listed here. Smoking and diabetes are highlighted um, primarily because these are the, the two predominant risk factors that we see on a day-to-day -day basis that play a role in the development of peripheral arterial disease and uh, uh, ultimate progression of chronic limb-threatening th uh, chronic limb threatening ischemia. And you can see in this chart here that uh, smoking and diabetes increase uh, a patient's risk three to four times that of the general population. And then ultimately, uh, what we have to keep in mind is that chronic limb-threatening ischemia is really an end-stage manifestation of systemic atherosclerosis. So these, all these patients have a high risk of uh, uh, accompanied, uh, or uh, have a high risk of concomitant uh, cardiovascular disease. They have a high mortality risk of uh, myocardial infarction and stroke. And the prognosis overall at one year is rather poor with a one-year mortality of 20 to 26% without aggressive treatment of these risk factors. Looking at the natural history of peripheral arterial disease, uh, you see that in general, the majority of patients present with either no symptoms or atypical leg pain. Uh, a, a large minority of them have claudication, uh, about 10 to 35 percent, and then a very small number actually have chronic limb-threatening ischemia at 1 to 2 percent. It was previously thought that the progression of uh, peripheral arterial disease to chronic limb-threatening ischemia at five years was rather low. Uh, however, more recent studies uh, have shown that this may be higher than originally thought with a, a study from 2006 that uh, demonstrated uh, the, the estimated rate of progression to, uh, of approximately 5 to 21 percent to chronic limb-threatening ischemia. If you look at the right side of this diagram, you see that these patients do have poor outcomes overall with cardiovascular mortality approaching 30 percent at five years um, and another uh, cardiovascular rate of mortality or morbidity, excuse me, at approximately 20 percent uh, at five years. Uh, and then one final thing to mention, uh, approximately 50% of patients that do present with uh, the diagnosis of chronic limb-threatening ischemia had no prior diagnosis or knowledge of peripheral arterial disease. Again, five-year amputation rates um, are uh, significantly higher uh, once a patient prog progresses to that critical level. Um, a study um, from the European Heart Journal in 2015 uh, based off the Rutherford classification with uh, Rutherford 6 obviously being the most advanced uh, presentation had a 67.3% risk of major amputation at four years. This correlates uh, with the overall mortality uh, uh, of these patients. So Rutherford 6 
classification, these patients had a 63.5% mortality at four years, very similar to that major uh, amputation rate. So uh, when, when diagnosing a patient with peripheral arterial disease uh, or chronic limb-threatening ischemia, you can often make the diagnosis based off the history alone, uh, having the patient describe their symptoms, the duration of their symptoms, uh, what brings the symptoms on, and what relieves the symptoms can often tell you um, if, they, if they truly have claudication and oftentimes what level of disease they have within the body. Uh, ischemic arrest pain, uh, as we know, usually affects the forefoot. This can often be confused sometimes with neuropathy, so it's sometimes hard to make that determination based off the history. It's also, it's also important to assess uh, other cardiovascular risk factors, uh, drug history, previous vascular interventions, and then the overall frailty uh, of the patient uh, to see if they're ultimately a, a potential surgical candidate. We then proceed with the physical exam and then ultimately non-invasive studies uh, followed by invasive imaging if needed. So with the history, again, as I mentioned, uh, just talking to the patient to see where their symptoms occur can often tell you a lot about the underlying anatomy of the disease. Patients that have primarily aortoiliac uh, occlusive disease will often complain of hip and buttock claudication with ambulation. Um, those with just isolated femoral popliteal disease will complain of calf claudication. And then oftentimes patients with tibio perineal disease uh, won't really have any complaints. Um, uh, of any type of claudication. Patients with uh, one segment uh, affected usually are those that present with claudication, whereas those that have uh, significant two-segment disease, uh, such as combined aortoiliac and femoral popliteal disease, are the ones that ultimately progress to chronic limb-threatening ischemia. Uh, we have seen more uh, recently, though, however, that patients uh, with severe diabetes and potentially uh, very severe uh, tibioperineal disease can often present with chronic limb-threatening ischemia with just isolated uh, tibioperineal disease, so this doesn't always hold true. This is a nice diagram from an article in 2006 that, that showed the, uh, the typical patterns uh, associated with um, uh, patients with uh, peripheral arterial disease and other diagnoses. So you can see in the middle there that patients with diabetes do tend to have more uh, severe tibio uh, perineal disease as opposed to somebody with uh, just tobacco abuse or hyperlipidemia that have more aortoiliac and femoral popliteal uh, disease. Uh, when starting a physical exam, it's always important to start with a pulse exam, uh, including the femoral popliteal pulses as well as the posterior tibial and dorsalis pedis. Uh, these patients will often have delayed cap refill, cool dry skin, especially below the knee, muscle atrophy, and then hair loss to the lower limb. Uh, this is a, um, an image obtained um, <clears throat> from uh, Medscape that, that demonstrates another finding common, especially those uh, with chronic limb-threatening ischemia, such as uh, uh, shown here. It's, uh, term the burger sign, but a lot of people just refer to it as dependent ruber. These patients oftentimes get relief by hanging their feet over the edge of the bed, and they'll often have this uh, uh, reddish appearance to their foot uh, because of that. Uh, it's easy to differentiate this from cellulitis, and the patients with dependent ruber will uh, develop pallor of their foot with elevation, as shown here. Other signs uh, are somewhat more obvious. Uh, you can see this a patient here with first toe osteomyelitis and likely uh, associated abscess. And then the, the picture on the right side of your screen there uh, showing advanced uh, ischemic changes to the foot. So as we uh, progress through our di the diagnostic algorithm um, uh, for peripheral arterial disease and chronic limb-threatening ischemia, after a, a history and physical, we then proceed with our non-invasive testing. That typically includes ABIs and Doppler waveforms. It's important to remember that uh, there's a high uh, risk of diabetes in this population, and those patients with medial calcinosis of the tibial vessels will oftentimes have falsely elevated ABIs that can fool you if you're not looking at the waveforms. Uh, and it's important to remember to check toe pressures and toe brachial indices uh, in this patient population that can often uh, under, or often um, uh, show you what may be uh, masked by a falsely elevated ABI. After the non-invasive uh, studies, we then proceed with staging the patient with uh, the new Wi-Fi staging system that I'll touch on here in a minute, and then ultimately uh, with more um, specific anatomic assessments with either duplex ultrasound, CTA, or MRA, um, uh, followed by potential digital subtraction angiography. So just an example of an ABI there on the left, you can see the right leg in this patient uh, is severely abnormal. The ABIs are low, but uh, even more drastic are the flat waveforms or blunted waveforms that are ind indicative of severe uh, peripheral arterial disease. Uh, normal arterial duplex is shown on the right of a common femoral artery uh, there with a the, with the standard triphasic waveform that we like to see. Uh, 
uh, PVR uh, recordings, or excuse me, pulse volume recordings are, are still often used. Um, uh, the assessment there on the left is normal, uh, the one on the right is abnormal, and this can oftentimes give you information about the underlying level of disease uh, in these patients. And then ultimately we can proceed with uh, CT angiography or digital subtraction angiography sh uh, shown there on the right side of the screen. So after uh, making the diagnosis, uh, we then proceed with uh, attempting to classify uh, the disease. This allows us to um, you know, uh, assess the risk of amputation in a patient uh, um, and then further assess what uh, interventions may be required and necessary to ultimately um, uh, succeed with a limb salvage. Uh, in the past, there's been multiple classification systems, including the Rutherford and Fontaine uh, that have been used primarily by vascular surgeons, Wagner, uh, and then the task classification, uh, which is all uh, hindered development of treatment algorithms given the heterogeneity amongst these commonly used systems. They've historically class uh, focused more just on pure hemodynamic and anatomic features uh, as opposed to the new Wi-Fi uh, staging system that we um, uh, in the vascular surgery world are using uh, on a day-to-day -day basis now. Uh, this is, uh, was recently put out um, and described in an article from the Journal of Vascular Surgery in 2014. Wi-Fi stands for wound, uh, ischemia, and foot infection. Each um, uh, group has a four is uh, classified on a four-point scale, and ultimately they're combined to give you a, an overall staging uh, at the end uh, to, again, give you the uh, overall risk of uh, amputation on each particular patient. So just to briefly um, show you an example, this is the wound um, index. It's, it again goes from zero to three, with zero being no ulcer, no presence of wound, and then three being extensive deep ulceration involving the forefoot and or midfoot with full thick, or, or with a full thickness uh, heel ulcer plus or minus calcaneal involvement. Um, similar uh, with the ischemia portion, ABIs, toe pressures, uh, the more severe the ischemia, the higher the grade, and then ultimately, uh, again, with the infection. This uh, chart shows you um, kind of how we uh, group these classifications into the ultimate stage, and then just uh, to demonstrate uh, stage one with low risk amputation, progressing to stage four with very high risk amputation, progressing from zero to 4% to 20 to 64% risk of amputation with a patient, uh, in a patient with stage four uh, Wi-Fi wi classification. Uh, another uh, diagram showing how we use um, this, uh, this staging. So on the, on the uh, left side, you see severity of ischemia, and then uh, on the lower uh, portion, you see limb severity, the ultimate Wi-Fi stage. And so patients with a high Wi-Fi stage and a high degree of ischemia are the ones that ultimately stand to receive the most benefit from uh, revascularization. So progressing on to treatment for uh, peripheral arterial disease and chronic limb threatening ischemia, uh, the use of medical therapy and lifestyle uh, changes cannot be understated. Uh, all of these patients, uh, if they smoke, should receive smoking cessation uh, education. The use of exercise, uh, and in particular supervised walking regimen, uh, has shown to greatly improve um, symptoms uh, as well as uh, limb salvage. Uh, hypertension management, diabetic management, all important. And then ultimately, uh, antiplatelet therapy along with statin therapy have really become kind of the mainstay of best medical therapy uh, for these patients, uh, particularly with aspirin or clopidogrel. Um, and then statin therapy, uh, especially as of late, has become essential uh, in managing these patients. And that holds true, uh, as shown in the Jupiter trial, um, that even those patients that don't have elevated uh, um, uh, cholesterol levels uh, stand to benefit from the use of a statin uh, should they have the diagnosis of peripheral arterial disease. And ultimately, um, uh, particularly in the chronic limb-threatening ischemia patients, most of these patients will require surgical therapy, either endovascular or open reconstruction uh, for, to ultimately succeed with limb salvage. So the ultimate goal of surgical treatment uh, is essentially um, to restore direct inline pulsatile flow into the foot of a patient with uh, particularly a wound. Um, patients with rest pain can sometimes benefit from you know, isolated intervention to the inflow arteries, uh, but, the, but the ultimate goal in a patient with a wound on their foot is to restore pulsatile inline flow directly to the foot. Um, uh, for a successful surgical bypass, you really need three things. You need adequate inflow, you have to have adequate outflow, and then a suitable conduit, which we particularly like to use uh, single segment, uh, greater saphenous vein if available. Um, the endovascular approach really depends on the complexity of the atherosclerosis within what's being referred to as the target artery pathway, uh, as I'll touch on here in a minute with the new glass uh, system of um, 
you know, an anatomic description of these patients, uh, and that really refers to the least disease tibial artery that provides dr uh, direct runoff to the foot, but can also be based off angiome, uh, uh, angiosome preference uh, if desired. So as I mentioned, this new glass uh, staging system or global limb anatomical staging system has been developed uh, from the recent uh, global vascular guidelines on the management of chronic limb threatening ischemia. And this was a joint effort uh, amongst uh, three um, uh, large uh, vascular societies across the world, including the Society of, of Vascular Surgery here in the U.S., to ultimately develop um, you know, appropriate algorithms to not only direct care for these patients, but to ultimately um, develop a better way to study uh, these patients to develop better algorithms in the future. This essentially um, replaces the, the, uh, the task classification that we've used in the past. Uh, the difference being primarily that the glass system really helps to um, stratify anatomical uh, patterns of the disease, but it makes an effort to um, simplify the process by limiting the grading uh, to just the infrainguinal disease and then focusing again on what I mentioned previously is the target artery pathway based on the least disease tibial artery providing runoff to the foot. Uh, the whole idea is that this will provide a framework to uh, improve what the designers refer to as evidence-based revascularization and then again further hope of having a defined classification scheme that can help uh, with the uniform reporting method for uh, ongoing studies and studies of the future. So just moving uh, through, uh, these describe the basic, um, what's the femoral popliteal grading and then the infrapopliteal grading that ultimately uh, you can see here develops a, a grade similar to the Wi-Fi uh, stage. This gives you a infrainguinal uh, glass stage that then can be used to determine how you may approach a particular patient. Uh, as you can see, it's recommended that patients with a high glass stage along with a high Wi-Fi stage uh, may likely benefit more from an open bypass as opposed to uh, an endovascular approach. Now, uh, it must be stated that this has not really been validated yet. This is a new uh, idea that was recently just put forward in the global vascular guidelines uh, that, that require you know, future studies to uh, ultimately validate the use of this system. So just briefly, uh, touching on the treatment algorithm proposed again by the global vascular guidelines, um, as you progress down to ultimately defining the anatomic stage of the disease with the glass. The next thing that needs to be determined, particularly in patients with a high glass stage and high Wi-Fi stage, is if there's adequate venous conduit, because that can ultimately um, help you decide whether or not to proceed with an endovascular approach first, as uh, a lot of vascular surgeons are doing today versus the primary open reconstruction. These are just some examples of uh, uh, treatments. Uh, this is a rather straightforward supraingonal uh, iliac stenosis that's treated with balloon angioplasty. You can see the results there on the right. Uh, more severe iliac disease that ultimately was unable to be treated with endovascular approach can still be uh, treated with a standard aorto bifemoral bypass uh, that has good long-term results. Infraingonal infra disease um, uh, in a very similar fashion, a high-grade uh, SFA stenosis treated with percutaneous transluminal balloon angioplasty, and then an ultimate, uh, ultimately a standard uh, infraingonal bypass, again there with a single segment uh, of greater saphenous vein. These uh, uh, intravascular and open uh, procedures can be used uh, together in what's uh, referred to often as hybrid therapy with uh, typically proximal or inflow um, uh, intravascular intervention and then, and then distal or infraingonal bypass. Um, and then there's several new advancements uh, that have come out recently that are being used uh, more and more uh, today. Uh, atherectomy, a lot of times uh, we use uh, UAB for vessel prep. Uh, to allow better apposition of the uh, uh, balloon or stent to the vessel wall and ultimately provide uh, a better result. Intravascular lithotripsy uh, is being used um, uh, now. Drug-coated technologies have been very popular. And then ultimately, peel access, which is not necessarily a new advancement, but is being used more and more uh, commonly today with these severe um, uh, tibial disease patients uh, to ultimately provide a way to get uh, across a uh, occluded vessel. And just uh, to kind of close here, um, you know, the importance of limb preservation really can't be understated. Uh, this is a study from 2012 published in the Annals of Vascular Surgery that showed patients that uh, ultimately um, had limb salvage, did not receive an amputation, had a 3.8% uh, uh, rate of, of uh, requiring a nursing home, whereas those that required an above-knee amputation was as high as 31.4%. 
you know, 3.2% of patients without an amputation uh, were uh, confined to a wheelchair, whereas 56.3% of those patients with an above knee amputation uh, had to uh, use a wheelchair. And then just a, a CAM uh, plot uh, kind of demonstrating the same thing, that patients with that, that ultimately keep both of their limbs ultimately do uh, significantly better. So finally, um, you know, barriers to management of this complex uh, patient population. You know, multiple specialties are involved in the treatment of these patients um, from, from a surgical standpoint. That includes vascular surgery, interventional radiology, interventional cardiology, and ultimately general surgery. This leads to a high variability of practice uh, patterns. There's not a, a ton of um, uh, strong evidence from randomized control trials to, to, to guide us in the management of these patients. There's ongoing randomized control trials that we look forward to seeing the results to ultimately help us decide what interventions will work best, including the basal two and three, and then uh, study, and then the best CLI study that are ongoing. And ultimately, there's a lack of public awareness. Uh, you know, there's uh, oftentimes failure to make an early diagnosis, and then a high percentage of these patients ultimately present with non-salvageable limbs and receive an amputation prior to even uh, undergoing a, a simple angiogram. Um, so at UAB, uh, we've recently developed the UAB Advanced Limb uh, Preservation uh, Program. It's a collaborative effort amongst uh, many specialties led by podiatry and vascular surgery. Um, you'll hear from my uh, colleague, Dr. Haverstock, with podiatry that's within our division that is ultimately spearheading this effort. And the idea is that we provide a single uh, place for these complex patients to go that can be seen by multiple specialties involved with the care of these patients, including not only podiatry and vascular surgery, but wound care, infectious disease, endocrinology, plastic surgery, ortho, nephrology, and cardiology. Uh, and ultimately, you know, if you have a patient that you're thinking about referring, uh, especially those patients with chronic limb-threatening ischemia, that requires really more of an urgent referral. As we often say, time is tissue, and those patients that have rest pain or tissue loss really uh, need to be seen soon and intervened upon uh, as soon as, as possible. Um, and then ultimately, any patient with severe peripheral arterial disease, uh, those with short-distance claudication at one to two blocks or lifestyle-limiting uh, lower extremity pain with ambulation uh, could benefit uh, from a vascular uh, evaluation. I thank you for your time, uh, and again, I uh, can be uh, reached uh, via email or uh, um, if you have any specific questions or any, any patient uh, issues you'd like to discuss.